Hello, Julie. Uh, hello, my friend. How are you? I am good today. I'm really happy to be here today. It's really good to see you. Yeah, it's been a little bit of a, a stretch, a couple weeks for us. It has been a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been some some child care issues in my family and um, some of it really joyful and some of it really hard. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'm really grateful that my my granddaughter, Nova May, is well on her way to um, a big healing that she's going through. She suffered a, a pretty severe burn to her right hand oh. on a camping accident. And oh, things could have gone in a way that I don't even like to even put out there, but we're just really, really grateful that she got such great care um, at the burn unit down in Phoenix. They, they sent her by ambulance down there for help and she got really good care and she's well on the way to recovery. So, yeah, so. <sighs> oh, the, the healing, I'm just imagining young Nova May and um, her inner healer coming mm -hmm. online to heal her and bring her back to health and well-being. Right. Yeah, it's been a miracle to watch her little body sort of going into a healing mode of knowing what to do. Yeah. And... Um, and, um, you know, and she's three and you just can't even imagine a little three-year-old needing to try to go through what she's had to go through. And she's so fierce. Mm. So, yeah. Well, I'm sure I'm happy mm. to hear that she's yeah. healing and I am positive she enjoyed having Nona there. She did very much. I was her captive. <laughs> I was her captive and happy to be her captive. Yeah. Well, Julie, I'm really curious during this time of um, activating Nova May's innate healing wisdom and her innate medicine um, and showing up as Nona, I'm mm. so curious about the poem that found you. Well, it is a sweet little, it's just kind of a sweet little journey. So the uh, the drum for drumming us into our program today is perfect hmm. because I am going to introduce you to a shamanic artist and poet who is um, from the Navajo tradition. And his name is David Sheflahe Paladin. I don't know if you have heard of him before. Um, but he is, he is widely recognized in the United States as um, kind of the, the father of contemporary Native American art. And um, he has quite an interesting story, but I will tell you that how I discovered him was this kind of strange, um, I, while I was in Flagstaff with my daughter and my granddaughter and um, just kind of being available, helping out there, I was having really vivid dreams dreams um and in my dreams i was actually seeing my hand drawing ah. imagery and i thought wow this is really this is really interesting i don't know if this is i don't know what this is but i really was looking forward to my dream state ah. thinking i wonder if it'll happen again kind of and so 
it led me to my meditation head to heart program where I have taught a lot of different art practices linked to mindfulness. And I thought, oh, it would be really cool to create a dream course around how to tap into your dream state and translate that into art. Mm. And so I got online and I Googled art meditation, um, art dreams. I just was Googling a variety of different things. And one of the things to pop up was on Amazon, a book called Painting the Dream, Mm. The Shamanic Life and Art of David Chesley Paladin. Mm. And so I thought, okay, like, who is this? I need to know a little more. So I decided to read the foreword of this book. And one of the... um, Within the foreword was a note from Matthew Fox, who I have mentioned to you in the past that I subscribe to his newsletter and I get a lot of value out of that. And so I find that he and this David were actually very good friends. Um, uh, David passed away in 1984, Ah. so he's no longer with us. Well, that pulled me in a little bit more to know a little bit more about this artist who does painting the dream. What is that all about? And so what I discovered was almost like, could this be, could one human being truly have lived all of this experience? So let me just give you a little introduction to this, this uh, beautiful artist and poet. Um, Interestingly enough, he, says in a little bit about his, um, in his autobiography that he was born at the bottom of the Canyon de Chez, which is in Arizona. And it is, um, the part of the Arizona Navajo reservation, Canyon de Chez. It's a stunning, beautiful, beautiful place in Arizona. Um, he was born to a Navajo mother, and a Roman Catholic priest. (laughs) You just can't make this stuff up. Now, shortly after his birth, his mother left the reservation, leaving him behind as an infant, a newborn, and she became a nun. Don't know what happened with his father, but that is part of his telling his story. Wow. Now he's left on this reservation with a, a community of people who truly take responsibility for being, for parenting responsibilities. So he has this, he has access to a lot of people within this tribe who just jump in and basically he is raised by his, this community. And um, he says that it was an ideal situation for him. He recognizes, you know, in telling his story as an adult, he recognizes that he truly experienced being a free, kind of a free soul. Mm -hmm. Um, Because while people, you know, made sure he was fed and clothed and safe. He had a lot of freedom within his experience of of how he lived his life. So cut to being around, I think, age six. And children at at this time in history, so this is the, the 30s, the 1930s, And um, Native children are being sort of rounded up and forced to go into Indian schools, which were residential schools across this country with the the purpose of assimilation and teaching them Euro-American ways of living Mm -hmm. um, and leaving their culture 
firmly behind. So it was a very punishing environment. And he, he mentions in another, so I read a little bit about this forward and then it sent me on some other, some other paths to find out more because I was so intrigued by his story. Um, and in another story, he talks about being sort of called the incorrigible runaway because he would break out of school every chance he got because it was a very punishing environment for him. So um, he runs away from school um, so many times that finally they just sort of like can't catch up with him any longer. Now, World War II has kind of broken out about the time period that he is around age 14, 15. Okay. And he he decides, like a lot of young men in the United States, that he is signing up. Mm. Now, there was a rule that you had to be 18 to join the military. However, one of the things I discovered um, in my long years of working with the military population is that during World War II, if you just said you were 18, they didn't check. Mm. So... <laughs> At 15, he becomes an, uh, joins the army and finds himself eventually sent to Germany. As a soldier in Germany, eventually he is captured by the Germans and he finds himself in a camp in Germany where he is um, undergoing a lot of mistreatment and eventually he is, and some of the story, I don't know that I have the complete thread, but eventually he is shot by the German soldiers who then put his body with a bunch of other dead bodies. So I don't know the experience of exactly how all that came about but he is shot, he is put with these other bodies, and this, the soldiers move along to wherever it is that they move along. Eventually, some British soldiers come through, start loading up these bodies onto trains because that's what they were doing with removing these corpses. He gets to the other end of wherever this train is going, and it is there that they discover he is not dead. And they put him into a hospital and eventually they send him home back to Santa Fe area, New Mexico, but he is in a coma state. Whoa. He stays in this coma state for two years as he is going through this talk about you know, a dark sort of night of dark night of the soul experience. So he is now about age 19 when all this is happening. Now, as he is, yeah, he's not even 20 yet. As he is coming, um, coming through this experience, he is also now a paraplegic as a result of his, injuries as a prisoner of war, which by the time they find him and, and, and he has gone through already being shot and left for dead and then transferred by these British soldiers to find him, he's like 68 pounds at this point. So he is in not great shape as he is now coming out of a coma, uh, but they are, they are amazed and impressed and see this is an amazing miracle that he is out of this coma. And um, there's something really interesting about this time. So it's 1946 when he regains consciousness. And as he was coming out in, you know, kind of coming into this wake state, he just blurts out telling his, the nurse who is his caretaker that he is an artist. And, um, and when he actually later on really returns to civilian life and has a, a facility, a place that he can actually paint, um, 
he's painting these really interesting abstract works that are in the style of an artist, a Russian abstract painter named Kadinsky. Mm -hmm. Now, Kadinsky died in France in 1944. Oh. We're talking about it being 1946 now. He is painting in this painter's style. He's speaking Russian. He had never had Russian training, but he is speaking Russian. He is speaking of experiences that were Kandinsky's life experiences, not his own and so it's my understanding that if you read this book, Painting the Dream, one of the things you find out is, uh, you know, they put together his horoscope, his chart against Kadinsky's chart, and they're like almost like mirror charts astrologically. Hmm. So that's a whole other rabbit hole to go down. But this is this is this experience that he is having where he's almost now expressing his life as if he is this artist, Kandinsky, painting in his style, speaking of life experiences and speaking Russian. So it's a little weird just to say. So this is happening while he's hospitalized and eventually he is visited in the VA hospital by Native American elders of, you know, of his uh, Navajo community. And the Native American elders put to him, you have two choices. You can choose this Western medical system for your healing, where you will never walk again. You will be stuck in this wheelchair the rest of your life. Or you can leave, check yourself out, and come with us, and you can let us facilitate your healing. Oh. And we can get you to walk again. So he checks himself out of the VA hospital, and he goes with these elders. And it must have been a real initiation that they put him through because one of the things that they recognized is that he had been tapped as a shaman. Mm. When you go through really painful, difficult um, experiences on this journey, often people say those are the people who are marked um, as wounded warriors and as on the, the shaman path, um, they almost die to themselves on behalf of the greater population because they come back with information that now makes them touched in a special way and able to truly share and facilitate healing on bigger levels. So they were rough with him. They threw him into water um, to make him like have to force to use his limbs and save himself. Um, there was, there was, it was, it was an intense time and he did regain full use of his body, all of his limbs. And the bigger issue was healing the emotional scars of everything he had been through at a very tender age and had caused so much for him. So about the same time he is, he goes through this incredible healing and he eventually then chooses to go to the Chicago Art Institute and really um, learn this craft of art and how he was going to not be Kandinsky, like, you know, how he was going to be. He's in Chicago at the Art Institute studying, doing his thing, and he meets the artist Marc Chagall. Oh. And Marc Chagall is a French, uh, Russian, modern, postmodern artist. 
And so he was at the Art Institute at the same time. And they became, you know, friends and colleagues. And one of the things that Chagall did for him is that he recognized that he was talented at making marks and copying other people's styles. But he really said to him, you need to draw on your Navajo native you know, customs and imagery, but you need to make them your own. You know, you need to draw on that. You have, you have this gift that landed in your lap as an artist, use it. And so he credits Mark Chagall of really putting him on his path of kind of creating his own style, which then becomes the contemporary Navajo art style. So that is sort of, a, you know, an overview about this man. Um.